So, yeah, my name's Leon Ancliffe. I'm the managing director of Blitz Film. And uh, we've been making films now for 10 years, but predominantly in healthcare. But my background is actually in the arts, uh, musical theatre and dance. And I've done everything from ballet through to burlesque. And uh, <laughs> before you ask, I'm really, really glad none of that was called in virtual life. <laughs> so, okay. So the first thing I'd like you to do, if you wouldn't mind, is if you've got your phone close to you, can you just take your phone and can you find an image on your phone that you've taken that brings back a really positive memory? I'll just give you a few moments to do that. Okay. <coughs> a moment that you were at, not one that someone sent you. Okay, now if you could just close your eyes for a second, and I, I appreciate some of the people at home who might be watching this being streamed will be watching it on their phone. So if you could just close your eyes and you could just think about a moment that you remember, and think about what it was about that moment that made it special. What was going on around you? And this moment's killing me because it's not going forward. I'm really sorry, Michelle. Point it. Um, should I do on the keyboard? There we go. So this is a, a moment for me. It's all right, not, not to worry. It's, it's happened. Okay, this was a moment that I have. Um, and this was taken uh, about two weeks ago, and it's in Iceland. And when you look at this moment, what do you think? I mean, I, I think peaceful, relaxing, um, quiet, and, and, and a nice moment to reflect. Well, actually, the reality of that moment is very, very different. I'm going to show you the reality of that actual moment and what was actually happening during that time. And this was taken about five minutes after that photograph. If you could just turn it up a touch, that'd be really great. Is that okay? So this was actually being shot on a VR camera. And as you can see what's going on around you, thank you Michelle, is a lot more dynamic than what the actual image suggests. Um, there was a lot of wind, there was, uh, the waves were crashing around me. It was, it, for me, it was really, really dynamic. And, um, What's really interesting is that the actual footage from the VR camera is completely different to the perception that you might have had from the image. And that's what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today, about actually immersing yourself within a moment. Okay, so we've talked about moments that you might have, um, might have been important to you. But just imagine you couldn't physically do some of the things you might want to do. And that will take me on to this lovely lady. So this is Sarah Zico, and um, Sarah is an artist. She's a mum, and she's one of the most incredible human beings. Um, and Sarah was diagnosed with motor neuron disease about 18 years ago now. She was pregnant with a second child. <coughs> and when she was diagnosed, within nine months of that they're being diagnosed, she couldn't even hold that child. And she'd been like that for a long time. Now, I don't know if anyone knows, but motor neuron disease is such a tragic um, disease, it can, can often take your life very rapidly. With Sarah, it took her mobility, but it kind of stopped there. Um, and I met Sarah, I was making a film for the MND Association called Understanding MND. And I asked Sarah whether she had any regrets, and she says, that she always wanted to swim the dolphins, and she was really upset that she never got the opportunity to do that. And at the same time, this was about four, three or four years ago now, I was doing a little bit of work with the BBC, and I remember my friend ringing me and saying, Leon, we've got some amazing virtual reality content. And I said to her straight away, is it synthetic? Is it like a game? She went, no, it's real content. And I says, what is it? And she says, swimming the dolphins. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we were actually able to bring these people together? to give Sarah that experience virtually. And we actually captured 
that experience. And this video has been out for about three years now. It's a bit dated, but it actually shows what happened during that moment. And it made a big, big difference to the way that we started thinking about how virtual reality could be used. I'm just going to play that for you. Sarah was born in 1965, always exuberant about life. She has two children and a passion for art and sculpture. At the age of 34, Sarah was diagnosed with motor neuron disease, a progressive disease that attacks the nerves in the brain and spinal cord. She's no longer able to walk, communicate verbally, or enjoy the many simple experiences we often take for granted. A country walk, a swim in the ocean, or just the simple freedom of movement. For people like Sarah, this has become impossible. But is it possible to deliver that experience virtually? It's time to think outside the body. In March 2016, we invited Sarah to experience virtual reality for the first time. I love feeling the movement because I can't move anymore. Sarah communicates with eye games, an advanced eye tracking technology. Virtual reality made me feel able what it took him after 16 years. The current virtual reality trend is on advancing gaming and entertainment markets, but we believe it has so much more to offer. Imagine having the freedom to explore and be transported anywhere, to be completely immersed in an environment <coughs> without restrictions. Creating specialised virtual reality content can make a big difference to so many lives and we are passionate about making it possible. Today was amazing. I love technology and I think virtual reality has so much potential for disabled people. Join us on our journey, creating virtual content that makes a difference. So let's think outside the world. So let's think outside the body. And um, that moment was so had such an impact on us, it made us completely think differently about how we might be able to use virtual reality. And we want to do more. So we started looking into the different areas that virtual reality were being used in healthcare. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not that passionate about gaming. I'm really passionate about healthcare. And it was interesting to see how it was being used. So this was a few years ago, so there's a lot more uses to it now. But back then, it was actually being used to treat burns victims. And as you can see, that's quite a cumbersome piece of equipment. But the gentleman is uh, having a dressing, and he's actually playing a virtual reality game at the same time. And it's almost like a distractive therapy. Um, and, and, and that, I guess, in a way, it reduces having to take a lot more medication, which I don't think is a bad thing. And it was being used for depression in the form of avatars, and that was really interesting to us as well. There's a lot of other ways it's being used. I can't go through them all, but I'm just going to skip through. So, also the military had started using virtual reality for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and they were one of the first adopters. But again, when I started looking at it, they wasn't using real content, they were using synthetic content. And, and what we'd seen was that someone had had an emotional connection because it was real and they felt like they were there. So the next thing we did was we approached Royal Trinity Hospice. We've got a really fantastic relationship with Royal Trinity. And uh, we thought they might be interested in giving virtual reality experiences to their hospice patients. So we showed them the film that we'd done with Sarah and we said, what do you think? Do you think we could do this? And the CEO, um, Dallas Pounds, actually says, why don't we start offering bucket list experiences? Some of the challenges we came up against back then was anxiety with new use of technology, but I imagine that um, is the same with any form of um, tech um, that people are trying to use. Tech capability within a hospice. Um, we wanted to basically prepare VR content so you, could, you didn't have to worry about streaming it. 
We wanted the content to be on the device, playing through an app, so that when you're giving an experience, it doesn't start buffering. When you're giving someone an experience, like a bucket list, the last thing you want it to do is start buffering. It, in some respect, it, it's quite cool. Tetherless VR. Um, there was a lot of work with the Oculus and the HTC Vive, um, real pioneers in the world of VR, but we were really interested in making virtual reality tetherless. If you're giving people virtual reality experiences who have limited mobility, the last thing you want to do is cable them up to a computer. Um, gathering and simplifying available content, and this is really interesting um, because we're offering bucket list experiences. And obviously, as a film company, we can't go out across the world, especially then we couldn't, and actually start capturing all this content. And for a lot of these people, their lives were quite limited, but the time they had to experience these experiences was limited also. So we started having a look online and finding content. And the thing about YouTube and Vimeo and some of the other platforms is this, it's almost like a dumping ground for virtual reality content. And what was really great was there was enough bucket list experiences there for us to be able to give patients the opportunity to um, have an experience. And you wouldn't believe it. Some expert, you, you think someone at the end of their life might be wanting something that's quite relaxing. But we were doing skydiving. We were doing surfing. We were doing all sorts of things. It's almost like sometimes when someone's coming to that stage in their lives, they feel uninhibited to actually try things. Um, and the last one is the withdrawal of VR content. And this is really interesting because when people connect with VR content and they feel it, how does it feel when you take them away from that experience? And we didn't see that, but we captured this one moment and I think it shows up really, really well. And this is with Susie. Oh, brilliant. Yes, well. I can see fantastically well. Your stuff. Wow. Oh, I see it now. Oh, my God. This is wonderful. I've seen elephants at the moment. Having a good old bath. Oh, this is all the things I asked for. Yes. And now it's horses. Oh, that's lovely. Did you enjoy that? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> really fun. There's something about life, isn't it? Especially when, you're, when you know you're coming to the end of it, where you want to revisit and recapture, and you can't do it. It's not practical. What I found was, there's one or two of the shots, where, where was it? There was one in particular. You complete exhilaration and um, just joy. I've got that for a long time. Okay. Joy is not something that's part of my life now. And for a moment I had it. It was just great. So come on, let's get back there. <laughs> so that's an example of what can happen when you give someone an experience and then you take them away from it. But we did ask her after whether she regretted having the experience, she said not at all. She felt like she'd lived the moment, which was really important. Okay, so, um, we're off, well, the people we were working with were vulnerable people, and a lot of virtual reality content's being developed for people who are fully able-bodied. And we want to actually understand a little bit more about um, the experience for people um, who, was, um, who we were given these experiences for. So we, we embarked on an ethically approved study with Royal Trinity Hospice, and to understand the potential of VR therapy in palliative care symptom management. I can't disclose um, the data at the moment. Uh, we're two-thirds of the way through, but honestly, some of the results that we're getting from the experiences are absolutely fantastic. And also, just observing over the last three years, people getting having virtual reality experiences, we're, we're starting to understand a little bit more about what makes those experiences powerful. And, and also, it's not about purely about the visuals. It's about the audio, the audio, the spatialised audio. When I, was, when I first started making films, I was told, Leon, do not disrespect um, the audio. It's 50% of your film. But actually, in the world of VR, I actually think it's more. Because in a way, the audio can lead you. It almost acts as if it's a narrative. It can actually lead you on that journey, <coughs> when maybe something visual can't. We're actually doing this with CW Plus. This is Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. Well, 
CW Plus is a charity, but we're doing it with Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, and they're piloting a bespoke VR content within their cardi cardiology department to manage symptoms of anxiety and to act as distraction during cath lab procedures. So when someone's actually having an operation, and this is really at the early stages, we, we've actually not started doing it yet, we're just capturing the content. Um, we, um, we're going to be able to, we're going to try and give them a VR experience as they're having that, that quite invasive um, surgery. So again, lots of research and understanding there. Connecting people with VR, yeah. I'm just trying to get through this really quickly, but VR is not, for me, I think when someone has a, a, an individual experience, it's quite insular. But actually being able to connect people, when we first got our virtual reality goggles and we got 10 sets, we envisaged that we'd be able to do group sessions. Four or five years ago, that was not possible. And we had to think creatively on how we can do this. Now this is Kay, to the left of me. And Kay um, has a, she had, does two children, she, has a she had a terminal condition. And she'd spent the last 12 months of her life living out her bucket list experiences. And one of them was she wanted to take her children to Disneyland, but as they were actually getting to that point, her condition deteriorated so rapidly, she wasn't physically able to do that. So we heard about Kay and, and Ben, her husband, and um, we, we thought maybe we could actually create that as a joint experience. So we chose four different experiences which we were able to get um, online of Disneyland, and the content was great, it wasn't too wobbly, um, it was really animated, and we gave them their experience. And I can't tell you how powerful it is when you, they're having that shared experience, and the daughter points up and says, Mummy, can you see Elsa? And she's in a parade. They're actually living that moment together, and it's really, really special. Shared experiences, for me, is the way VR needs to be. Because VR is about creating moments that we can all relate to, and if we can't share an experience, what is the point? Talking about sharing, which is really interesting, it's great to see a VR camera here today, but we've um, been live streaming VR as well, and, and, and none more importantly than, again, with Kate. Now, because they've been so um, supportive of what we were trying to do with the Disney experience, Kate said to me, I said, is there anything else we can do for you, Kate? And she says, well, in two weeks, she says, I don't know whether I'm still going to be here, but my daughter is, um, she's meant to be getting an award at Sarah, she, she's She's getting an award at school, and I told her I'd be there. And I said to her, Kate, I, I said, as long as we can get the support at the school, we could potentially stream that to your hospice bed. And, and she says, do you think it's possible? And we've never done it before, but we said we'd try. And we spoke to the school, and they were really supportive. So we went down to the school. We had someone set up at the hospice with Kate, with the goggles. We went down to the school. We set up the laptop. We created the streaming network. And then I said to Ben, her husband, I put the camera right in the middle of the audience. There must have been about 500 people there. And I said to Ben, Ben, when your daughter gets up on stage, I don't want you to think of that camera as being a camera. I want you to think of, about it being Kate. And he said, I will. And, and, we set, and, and the award started. And honestly, I can't tell you how powerful it was when the headmaster got up on stage and started speaking to the camera as if it was Kate, saying, we're so glad you can be here, Kate, um, through the use of technology. And on, and on that note, I'd like to introduce, uh, bring your daughter up on stage to get her award. And as she came up on stage, Ben looked at the camera and he just gave her the biggest smile. And honestly, it was, it was just magical. Um, we, we haven't done it as much since then with streaming it, but I think that one experience just kind of blew our mind. Virtual reality tours, happening quite a lot at the moment. Um, this is one uh, with the Motor Neuron Disease Association. They uh, do, um, a lot of their funding goes into research and development, and this is Citra and their lab in Sheffield. And they want to be able to show their supporters how their money's being spent. So we've just created a virtual reality tour for them. We're doing one for the St. Monica Trust, which is a care home and dementia unit. And we also did one for Trinity. Um, but what's really different about our virtual reality tours is you get to meet the people who will be caring for you throughout your experience there. Hello and welcome to Royal Trinity Hospice. I'm Dallas and I'm lucky enough to be Chief Executive here. We know that some people don't understand what we do in a hospice, but we're really proud of what we do. So we'd like to open our doors to you today and take you on a 360 degree tour. 
So don't forget to look all around you while you're on the tour. I'm going to head into reception now where I'll meet you and introduce you to Sylvie. So actually clinicians now, as opposed to going out into the community, still a big stigma around hospice and hospice care. And um, often you'll have people who are coming to the end of their lives and they're, they're scared about going into the hospice. And the whole idea with this film was so they could see it for what it is. And by the end of the film, they wouldn't feel scared to try it. And, um, and throughout the experience, all these people that you see are actual people that would care for you during that process. And we've got clinicians now, um, nurses, CNSs, that are going out and they're actually using this as, as opposed to taking a brochure where you look at still images, they take a set of goggles and they give the patient the experience virtually. And it's working. Okay. So, like I said, we've been making films for, for quite a while now, but our, our, the first film we ever made was for a hospice um, in East London, and it was a training film. So, the kind of, our, a lot of our work is, is, is training. A lot of the films we've made is training, um, our training. And we've always wanted to make our training films as, as realistic as possible. So when we've been giving all these virtual reality experiences out, we actually thought, could we recreate some of those training films we've made, but virtually? And we came up with reels. So reels, what is reels? Reels is reality enhanced experiential learning scenarios. Learn from a moment in someone's shoes. So this is Jerry. That's Jerry in that hospice bed. Jerry's named after my granddad. And he was one of the last people, uh, he was the first one of the first people I give, gave virtual reality to. Uh, he died now, um, but he's a real character and I thought it'd be really great to name the camera after it. But the thing with Jerry is Jerry could be any one of us. Any one of us in this room. And, and in this particular scenario, Jerry is a hospice patient. So you put the goggles on and you are a hospice patient who can't speak, who can't communicate, but you can see and you can think. And what happens in this scenario is you have healthcare professionals who come into the room, they don't give you eye contact. They don't say, hello, my name is. They speak to the daughter about things that is completely inappropriate to you. Now, how do you show a healthcare professional that what they've just done is wrong? The best way to do that is to enable, is to put them in that other person's shoes. And that's what Reels is. It basically enables you to put other people in the shoes of, of, of Jerry, in some respects. And um, so Reels, it's quite early days, but we're very excited about it. And I'd just like to show you a very short testimonial uh, from some of the nurses that are using them. And this is a hospice patient, but we've done them on conflict, we've done them on so many different things, and we've got a lot more stuff on the website that you can have a look at. So, so I'm about to experience a virtual reality with a family member that's been confrontational. I haven't had much confrontation yet in my training and I'm a little bit anxious about it, so I think having virtual reality would prepare me for the real life. It was pretty intense, um, but it was really good because obviously I knew I was in a safe environment. It puts you in that situation. You can see them cry if you're, yeah, in their world, it's, it's like it's real. In this case, I think if you experience it virtually, then you feel that emotion, you deal with that emotion, you reflect on it, and then when it happens in real life, you're much more prepared. So that's just some of the nurses that have been using it. Um, and the responses are absolutely fantastic. Now this next section is actually framed in a phone, because what I want you to think about is that phone that you took out earlier, um, or that phone that you might be using as we're streaming this uh, event. That phone is not just a phone. The phone has been around forever and it's about connecting people. But in a way, this now is a window of opportunities and a window for you to learn. Um, in, in some respects, that phone can be the most valuable training tool you've ever had. So this little bit is about some of the experiences. So imagine you were homeless and this is, this is your home. This is what you see when you wake up. Now, Trinity, again, they, um, they were doing Homeless Awareness Week and a lot of their staff were asking themselves why was there not um, more, hot, more um, homeless people using the services? Because in some respects, they have a greater need. And there's quite a big homeless population in Clapham. And so, what they, so they came to us and said, is there anything you can do? And actually, I've got to get this right, 
Uh, there was a film online, a virtual reality film called Look the Other Way, and it basically gives you the opportunity to experience what it's like to be homeless. And, um, and yeah, it's fantastic. So we gave that experience to them, and I'd just like to show you what their response was to that. I think it's really changed the way I'm going to grow and look up. Uh, and I have homeless people in my mind. Yeah, I'm not going to put you through that for too long, guys. Uh, we'll just give it a few more moments. And I... I just give it 30 more seconds. Yeah. Okay, so basically what happens is we give um, the virtual reality experience to the healthcare professionals and they get to experience what it's like to be harmless and actually it changes them. It changes their viewpoints. And they actually say at the end of that little video, Oh my God, next time I see a homeless person, I'm going to think differently about what I do, the way I speak to them, even to the point, the way they give them eye contact. And that video is actually on, on the website, you can see it. But some of the other ways we're going to be using reels is uh, we've just uh, got um, a great project with the Moorfields Eye Hospital. So we're going to be able to give healthcare professionals the experience of a patient who might have glaucoma. So virtually, they'll be able to experience what it's like to be a patient. Um, say they're led and they're having an operation and I think one of the key things that Morfields want to, to get across is the WHO checklist so that will be covered in, 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 in the resource as well but I'd really like to just take us on to this final one and we only filmed this last <coughs> week and this is with the Metro charity and um, we've been working with them for the last six months and what you get to experience through Reels is, is um, the opportunity to be someone who has HIV. So you're a young person, in this particular scenario, you're a young person who's been born with HIV. And I know that doesn't happen that often now, but the person that you're playing is someone who's a bit older and might have been born in the 90s. And they're born with HIV, and they basically have to disclose that they have HIV, and. And, it's a, and what we've done is we've created multiple scenarios where that person will be able to put on the goggles, be a person with HIV, they disclose their status, and then they get to see the response from disclosing that status. And the scenario I'm going to show you now, which I really hope plays, because I think it's really powerful, is actually a negative response. But actually, with the work we've been doing with the Metro Centre, we've created other responses which are much more positive. And this is a resource that's going to be online in the next few months, and young people will be able to interact with it. And what's fantastic, again, is it's technology and it's being used with young people, and it's as easy as having a mobile phone and a pair of cardboard goggles. So I'm just going to play this for you. Are you serious? You are sneaking at my house? We shared a pizza together, and now we tell we have HIV. I It's only short, guys, so I'll, I'll keep it playing. It does play a lot smoother in the goggles, I thought. It's really into your personal space. Can I catch it from you? That's disgusting. So I know that played a little disjointed, but I think you get a feeling for how powerful that can be when you actually visually get to experience that. And that's what Reels is about. It's about giving you virtual reality training that is as real as we possibly can make it. 
And, and all the scenarios that you see in the, in, in the films we make are inspired by real people. It's inspired by you. And I'd just like to finish with uh, Chris Milk, who's been a big, big inspiration to me. Uh, virtual reality is the ultimate empathy machine. There are opportunities to walk a mile in someone else's shoes in Chris Milk. Um, and, and the thing is, what I would say is, yes, there is the opportunity to walk a few miles in someone else's shoes. But the sort of content we've been creating, we've purely been focusing on the visuals and the audio, so you can't move in that environment. It's purely about what's happening around you, and we really want to get that right before we start moving on into other areas. That's the end of my seminar. I'm sorry it was a bit disjointed, but thank you very much. <laughs>